Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Elhamdülillahi Rabbil alemin ve salatu ve selamu ala Nebiyyina Muhammedin ve ala alihi ve sahbihi ve sellem Eşhedü en la ilahe illallah ve eşhedü enne Muhammeden abduhu ve rasuluhu emma ba'd Today we're looking at the chapter what is important about seeking rain through specific stars. So here we're looking at the issue of seeking rain through and what. Well, we're going to get into what that meaning is. So Shaykh Ibn Uthaymin, rahimahullah, he begins by mentioning that the word al-istiqa, عفواً, al-istisqa, because the chapter says, ma jaa, that which has come, al-istisqa, in relation to seeking rain, bil anwa, through the stars. Al-istisqa is to seek rain, the same way al-istighfar is to seek forgiveness, Al-isti'ana is to seek assistance, al-isti'adha is to seek refuge, etc. So here, we are seeking the rain, talab al And it divides into two types. Number one, seeking rain in relation to stars divides into two types. The first type, which is major shirk, and the second, is that which is lesser, means is lesser shirk. The first one, in relation to major shirk, it has two forms. One is supplicating to the stars to provide rain. Such as if a person were to say, oh so and so star, give us rain or water, or cause uh, rain, or give us water. This is major shirk, because it's dua to Adnan Allah. Allah says, وَمَنْ يَدَعُوا مَعَ اللَّهِ إِلَاهًا آخَرٌ لَا بُرْهَانُ لَهُ بِهِ, عن, uh, به فإنما حسابه عند ربه إنه لا يفلح الكافرون. And whoever invokes besides Allah any other deity any other deity without any proof then his reckoning is on with his Lord, really the disbelievers are not successful, or will not be successful. So we know if you supplicate directly to a star, this is dua li ghayrillah. Now we know the hadith, it's authentic, a dua huwa al-ibad, dua is in itself is worship. And the Shaykh said, Allah says, وَأَنَّ الْمَسَاجِدَ لِلَّهِ The Masajid belong to Allah. فَلَا تَدْعُوا مَعَ اللَّهِ أَحَدًا Do not call for anyone besides Allah. What does the word dua, or sorry, Masajid is ayah mean? It can refer to two things. The Masajid can refer to the actual places where we pray. So the buildings, like we're in now a masjid. Or it can refer to the body parts. This is a masajid. It is a place of sujood. The forehead, the nose, the two hands, the two uh, knees, the two feet. These are the masajid. Because when the word sajid, they're a place of sujood. Allah tells in the Quran, Ya Bani Adam, khudu zinatukum indi kulli masjid. Oh Bani Adam, take your zina, your adornment, at every masjid. So how we benefit from the ayah? When the man uses ayah for shurut salah, you have to cover yourself because the masajid are the body parts. It's one way. The, the muwati are sujood. So wear your zin over them. Cover your body. Second angle is when you go to the masjid, wear good clothes. So of course, masajid belong to Allah. Don't supplicate to anyone else besides Allah in there. Allah says, وَلَا تَدْعُوا مَعَ اللَّهِ مِنْ دُونِهِ اللَّهِ مَا لَا يَنْفَعُكُ وَلَا يَدُرُّكُ فَإِنْ فَعَلْتَ فَإِنَّكَ إِذَنْ مِنَ الظَّالِمِينَ And evoke none besides Allah, any that will neither benefit you nor hurt you, and if you do so, you certainly be from those who are oppressors. Surah so Yunus, Ayah 106. So the first type of seeking rain, 
from the stars, which is major shirk, is to actually supplicate to them directly. And we know this is clearly shirk. The second type is to ascribe the rainfall to the stars, that they themselves are the causers of the rain, not Allah. And this is a violation of Tawheed and Rububiyyah, Allah's Lordship. Because we said before, no good, no evil, except it comes from Allah. Allah is the one who brings about the rain. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who brings about life and death. And He's the Mudabbil. He is the one who is administering the entire universe. So for someone to believe that the stars themselves can bring about the rain, this is shirk. Clear. Because we've given now an aspect of the Rububiyyah, Lordship to Allah. It's not allowed. We know the clear proof showing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in the control. Yudabbiru amara min as-samai Allah, he, he is the one who administrates the affairs from the heavens and the earth. This is very important. And so no one can come and say this. At the same time, to believe that would also imply that they have this capacity, these stars, to bring about rain and to bring about good and harm. And we know they don't. Last week we covered what is the cost, the purpose, and the hikmah between the cre- behind the creation of the stars. And we saw there's only three of them. Whoever goes beyond that, to suggest that another reason behind it is committing takalluf, unnecessary burden in terms of their own knowledge. But more than that, if they start saying things like this, they're doing shirk. So we know there's no such a idea. And this is what the chapter is going to address. That is disbelief, a major shirk to associate or to attribute the rainfall to the stars. But then the second type is that it's lesser shirk, and that's when you take it as a means. When somebody believes that the appearance of certain stars is a means, a sabab, to the rainfall, this is minor shirk. Why is this? I said before in the lessons, what's the principle? Any means not found or not established in the sharia that somebody will take as a means, means not, there's no proof for it, but you've taken as a means, this is minor shirk. It's a wasir, we'll a pathway to major. So we always know, how do we know something is a legislative cause? It has to be proven in the Kitab and Sunnah, or it has in and of itself a reality, a haqiqah in the world. So nobody was going to come today and say that a star appeared in the Western Hemisphere, therefore the rain is coming. What connection is there between the star and the rainfall? There isn't. The same way, when we look at this subject, we see we need to be careful how we attribute the blessings of Allah. This is the benefit. The whole chapter is we're talking about rain, but we also take a side benefit, which is always attribute the benefit, the blessing, the bounty of Allah to Allah. This is from the Tawheed that we're learning here. And we look at today's world, the way that we use certain languages, the way we, we, we talk, we tend to attribute at times the blessings of Allah to other than Allah, not knowing them. Not really, you know, scrutinizing the words that we're using, the phrases that we're using. We're actually attributing Allah's blessings to other than Him. So here the Shaykh Shaykh Islam begins with a verse وَتَجَعَلُونَ رِزْقَكُمْ أَنَّكُمْ تُكَذِّبُونَ And instead of thanking Allah for the provision He gives you on the contrary you deny them you deny Him Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Surah Waqi'ah ayah 82 So here this is the verse to prove that this is in relation to ascribing rizq the provisions of Allah to other than Him so we're not allowed to do that. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has favored us with rizq. But here, rizq can be of many types. We know before, rizq is not only what you eat and drink. Not the nourishment of the body only. Shaykhs are other types of rizq, like ilm. Ilm is a rizq. It's very important, we understand that. And the other types of rizq, for example, the rizq, the provision of Iman, Al-Islam, Hidayah, guidance. So that which is, generally scholars say, the rizq can be of two types, Bedani, that which is in relation to the body, and that which is in relation to the, to the deen. Now, the deen, the rizq, the provision of religion, in relation to your soul, your guidance, your brightness, it's a provision of Allah. Al-Qur Rabbi, Zidni Ilma, when you ask Allah to increase your knowledge, not something small, it's a provision of Allah. So the Shaykh saying here, in this we see Allah, He refutes and He criticizes those who give thanks and praise for provisions as negation, arrogance, and aversion. Giving thanks for provisions should be through acknowledgement, acceptance, 
and by obeying the provider of them. So the first thing we need to be attributed to Allah. We don't reject it. And we don't forget it's from Allah. Allah says they are aware of the blessings of Allah, then they deny it. It's not the way they believe it. We don't want to be ungrateful to Allah. Attribute the provision first to Allah. He is the one who is the razaq. But Shaykh says when it comes to rejection, it can be of two types how you can reject anything rejection by utterance on the tongue or by actions. So we know somebody can reject something by saying this this is a lie or rainfall is from the stars. So rejecting Allah is the one clearly providing rain. Or by actions. And how is it by actions? By praising the stars, believing that it's a cause instead of praising Allah. And that's what the benefit we take from it. So this is why the Baba Amal. You're not actually saying Allah doesn't bring the rain, but you're praising the stars, not Allah. That's by action. So a person should always attribute the provision of Allah to Allah. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He's the one who provided it for us. And the Shaykh brings a statement of Umar, Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, Allah, as a proof for this, but I don't know the authenticity of it, so perhaps we'll look into that narration. The first hadith in this chapter is the hadith of Abu Malik al Ash'ari radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Four things are from the affairs of days of ignorance among what my ummah, my community, will not leave off or they will not abandon. Number one, pride over status. Number two, disparaging lineage. Number three, seeking rain through stars. And number four, wailing over the dead. And then the hadith continues that the female, the woman who wails over the dead, if she does not repent before death, she be raised on the day of resurrection dressed in a large garment of pitch and an itch infested cloak reported by Muslim so this hadith is the first hadith that Shaykh al-Islam Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab is going to use to prove that it's prohibited to seek rain through the stars and this is a side benefit the word anwa or no this is what the words we refer to. No, it refers to the phases of the moon. Some of the scholars says it refers to the phases of the moon. While other scholars say it's more general refers to anything in regards to the movements of the stars. The appearance of this star, the appearance of that one. It could be a little more general. So this hadith is an important hadith. Rasulullah said, Arba'un, four affairs, min amr jahiliya, from the affairs of jahiliya, there will be in the ummah. For um, uh, the four things from the umur, the affairs of Jahiliya, will be if ummati, my ummah, la yatrukunahun, they will not leave it off. It means that these affairs will continue to last in the ummah. So the first one he began with, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is al fakhr bil ahsab, having this kind of pride over your lineage, your descent. So Shaykh Ibn Sayyidina rahimullah begins. So when he talks about these affairs, he says the four is not restricted to just four, but these are four in the hadith. There are more. The four in this hadith. And my ummah means the ummah that accepted his call, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So it's talking about the Muslims. So we know this ummatul da'wah and this ummatul ijabah. So the ummah can be divided, we talk about the Ummah nation, can be divided in two. The Ummah, are the people who already accepted the call of Islam. That's us, Muslims. And there's the Ummah of the Da'wah, those who have to go and we, we call them to Islam. So here he's saying, he's referring to the, those who accepted his call, those who skept, accepted the call, so those who are already Muslims still have these four affairs of Jahiliya still lingering in the Ummah, which is not good, we know this. So here, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam begins off with the the first one, but the Shaykh says, what is this affairs of Jahiriyyah? He says here, these affairs, Umur Jahiriyyah, refers to affairs that were in the Jahiriyyah. So it could be commands, or orders, or things that he used to do. So the first one he begins with Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, is this arrogance people have, or this kind of pride, in regard to their descent, their lineage, and their background. 
So the Sheikh here, when he talks about this, he says here, prior to the noble descent, Al Fakhr bil Ansab, I'm oh, sorry, Afwan, Al Fakhr bil Ahsab, he says here, it's noble descent, someone who has a good descent, you're trying to be proud of it. And the honor or respect that an individual has, such as if the individual is from Biru Hashem, so he takes pride in that, or his father or grandfather were brave, so he takes pride in that, or the fact that, you know, any of these kind of things that are usually boasted about. In reality, this was from, this was from Jahiliya. Because if your forefathers who you're boasting about or your great lineage, it doesn't bring you closer to Allah. So in reality, Jahiliya used to believe that. My great descent makes me special, makes me nearer to Allah. And we know it's not true. In Islam, Allah corrected that. He told us that the real thing that makes us, distinguishes us is our taqwa. إِنَّ أَكْرَمَكُمْ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ أَتْقَاكُمْ so that destroys the whole idea that depending on the lineage Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you or descent that you came from, which Allah decided, not us, that I'm better than you and you're better than me. Yes, certain lineages and descents are better than others. The soul sallallahu has the best. But in reality, is that something to boast about? No. Taqwa, this is what makes the difference. So in reality, this is something which is dangerous. And it's from the umur al jahiliyyah so we know. If you hear something from Jahiriya, the position in Islam, then it's rejected. Something from the affairs of Jahiriya, it's not accepted. It's something which is should be abolished, something which should be looked down and, 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 and stayed away from. As a reminder, what does Jahiriya refer to again? When we covered the book of Masayur Jahiriya, we spoke about the term Jahiriya. And we said it means, when we talk about the time period, the time period, Qabr al-Ba'ath, before the descent of the Prophet Sallallahu before the dispatchment of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is the time period, the Zaman of Jahiliyyah. So therefore, when the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came, there's almost Zaman of Jahiliyyah. Be wary of it. If you hear some people say, we're in Jahiliyyah, you say, Akhi, what do you mean? Clarify the terms you're using. Because it's already gone Jahiliyyah. Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has come. He came with the Haqq. And he told us that the affairs of Jahiliyyah, in general, kullu, all the affairs, he said, all the affairs of Jahiliyyah, mawdu'un tahta qadameen. They're abolished underneath my foot. And the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Sahaba, after the conquest of Mecca, affairs of Jahiliyyah are finished. The truth has come, falsehood is destroyed. But in reality, that's the time period. But the second type of meaning of Jahiliyyah, which is more general, we said, Kullama khalif, everything and anything that, this, that goes against ma jabihi Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That's Jamur Jahiliyyah as well. So everything that opposes the Kitab and Sunnah, we can call it Jahiliyyah. Because in reality, the Quran and Sunnah came to guide the people and correct that stuff. So clear, so this was the scholars they mentioned, like in Fatih al-Majid. Another big scholars, كُلَّ مَا يُخَالِفُ مَا جَاءَ بِهِ رَسُولُ صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ فَهُوَ جَاهِلِيَّةٌ Everything that opposes the, what the Prophet صلى الله has come with is uh, from the Jahiliyyah. So here, when you hear something from Jahiliyyah, it's now something which is small, which is stay from it. And then, to make it clear how this is from Jahiliyyah, if we look to the Quraysh, this is what they used to believe. Allah says, مَا أَمْوَالُكُمْ وَلَا أُولَادُكُمْ بِالَّتِي تُقَرِّبُكُمْ عِنْدَنَا زُلْفَى That they used to believe, that the Quraysh, Allah says, not that your wealth and children which you, you know, boast about and you have, it's not this that brings you nearer to us. إِلَّا مَنْ آمَنْ وَعَمِنَ صَالِحًا Except for one who believes in his righteous deed. وَلَاِكَ لَهُمْ جِزَاءُ الضِّعْفِ بِمَا عَمِلُوا هُمْ فِي الْغُرُفَاتِ آمِنُوا So these people, Allah would multiply the reward, double the reward, and give them the houses, the rooms of, of great dwellings in paradise. So he reproves the Quraysh to believe that their, their children and their wealth, they bring them near to Allah. And from this descent, so therefore we cannot be in the Mu'adhibin, and those are punished. So this is something that's wrong, you can't believe that my descent will protect me. It won't help you. Second thing is that people generally to talk about their forefathers, some of them might not even vote, maybe Muslim. So if you're boasting and have pride for someone who's dis- died disbeliever, what fa'ida is that? Rasulullah said, In Allah azhaba ankum ubiyyat al jahiliyyat jahiliyyah. Allah has removed from you the, the kind of haughtiness of jahiliyyah they used to have. Wal fakhraha bil aba. And the arrogance and pride you used to have with, their, with your forefathers. And so people in reality are only two types. People are only two types. Birr and taqi, some are righteous and pious, or oh, fasiq, a wicked person, shaqi, who is miserable. Well, then he said, then he told us that all of us, Banu Adam, the human beings in general, 
They're from Adam. Adam is from Torah. Adam is created from dust. To the end of the Hadith Abu Dawood, Sahih. So in reality, there's no point of boasting. That's the first one. The second one is the opposite or connected to it. وطعن في الأنساب. So now, so the first thing you're boasting about your descent, and second, you you're disparaging other people's descent. Right? So you're disparaging their descent, their background, or their lineage, or their family, by pointing out deficiencies and weaknesses and blemishes. And Sheikh says here, so an individual will find fault in his lineage, such as say, you're a son of a tanner, you're a son of a, a circumciser, or something like this, to below the, below the person. In reality, this doesn't harm anybody. We know the hadith of Abu Dhar, radiallahu ta'ala anhu and Bilal. What happened when Bilal went to Rasul Sallallahu to talk about, or to complain about what Abu Dhar said to him, by calling him the son of a black woman. This is part of it. Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, A'ayyartahu, did you insult him, ummihi, by his mother? Inna ka imru'um fi ka khasilatun mujahideen. You're a man who has one characteristic of jahideen or ask of jahidi with you. This is Hadith Bukhari Muslim. So what does this benefit us? That there can be khasail, there can be some khasail, some kind of characteristic of jahidi is so present. And you can say this without saying that somebody is jahidi. Now we do be loving that. Like the Sahabi, the Quran is pointing out one aspect, this aspect, like that's some jahidi. So we also benefit the impermissibility in Islam to curse somebody or to assault them by their mother and their father. To talk about their being black or white or from this. And nowadays, for example, with nationhood, you're from this country. So you know nothing, right? How do you mean that? This is not the way of Islam. So we benefit from here. The source has been correct about that in this. And without change, then he, 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 he took that admonishment and he sought forgiveness of Bilal. So then the next one <coughs> in the relation to this, Mr. Shahid of this hadith, is Al Istisqa'u bin Nujum. He's seeking rain through the stars. This is the shahid of this whole hadith. Seeking rain through the stars or be known by the stars. In reality, this is the issue because the hadith is talking about, or sorry, sorry the chapter is talking about the impermissibility of that. And istisqa'u means seeking rain. We have in Islam al salatu istisqa, the rain prayer. That's a sharia way, the shari'i way to gain rain or to obtain rain from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala means you do this prayer, hope from Allah to bring down the rain. But al istisqa or bin no or bin nuju, nothing to do with Islam. So here we benefit, that's the shahid. So the Shaykh says here, actually being rainfall to the stars, even by believing that Allah the Almighty is sublime, is indeed the one who caused the rainfall. But if a person believes the stars caused the rain and the clouds or invokes the stars, then this is Shaykh Akbar. So taking as a means, minor shaykh. Taking as a cause, major. And the last one, and niyaha, wailing, wailing over the dead. And niyaha is deliberately making loud cries and while weeping over the dead. It is necessary to add that it like the deep hooting sounds of pigeons. It is the sound of people with the wheel, they're shouting loudly. They're not patient with the death of somebody. So Sheikh says here that the people of Jahiriya, they used to do this. For some reason, the one was only to increase the will and his difficulty and sadness and punishment. So, if you look at why the Sharia is against this, when you will, you only make it more difficult for yourself. Because willing or not willing won't stop the death. Someone passed away, that's the reality you cannot change. Number two, it implies showing discontent for Allah's decree. And this is a serious affair. When Allah decrees something, even if it's difficult, we have sabr, patience upon the qada of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we know our sabr in the sadmatul ula. It's in the first. Striking of that calamity. So everyone can be patient after 10 years. You have no choice to accept the reality. But it's in the beginning when you heard you lost all your money, and parents, someone died, or this car crashed. How do you feel? That's what sabr is. Immediately. You accept it, you understand it, you bring, turn things back to Allah. See, this is very important. This is what Islam teaches us. We're in Jahili, we're not doing this. They also agitate the sadness of other people. Because when you wail, you make other people cry too. You're crying and wailing and not accepting their crying as well. And altogether, it's prohibited in Islam. And also, despite all the evil, it does not prevent the, pre- the pre-adornment. What even stop the qadr of Allah? So cry, don't cry, the qadr of Allah came. Allah says the affair is one decree already. 
So what we benefit as well from this is niyaha, is not permissible in Islam, really. And we have to be wary of it and encourage the Muslims not to do that, especially in the janais, the funeral prayer, it's not to be wailing. Crying is permissible, but not wailing. The difference between the two. Crying comes with the eyes and the sides in the heart. Wailing is the shouting, the, the loud noises, the impatience. And to show you the prohibition and the sin of the one who's wailing, the Rasulullah said, and na'ihatu, the woman who, who wails, if she doesn't repent before her death, tuqamu alayha yawm al qiyamah, or tuqamu yawm al qiyamah, she will stand the day of judgment, wa alayha sirbalun min qatiran. She'll be wearing a, a, a cloth, a garment of pitch, and it's black, like, she looks like elf, uh, asphalt, like a zalf. It's like, it's like the asphalt, black. Some scholars say the sirbal is like a, it's like a, it's like a tamis or a thawb. So the wearing of made of pitch, or black, tar, or asphalt. And on top of that, more severe punishment, which we also have, dir'un min jarb, which is an itch infested cloak. And Muhammad Qurtubi in Mufhim, he says the reason for that is to increase her in the punishment. But to also show the severity of the issue. So when someone passes, we should not be wailing. We should not be wailing. But a side benefit from niyaha is also the common practice of getting together and having food at the house of the deceased. The Sahaba and Salaf, they consider that min niyaha. So we need to be aware of that as well. It's not from the practice of Islam. When someone passes, we go to the deceased person's house and we have food and we sit. Jirir ibn We used to see And that word nara means we the Sahaba Which now shows you again Amr did the sunnah or it's Muharram, prohibited al ijtima ala ila ahl al To gather the house of the deceased Gather the house of the deceased Wa sal'at al-ta'am min al-niyah And making food to be from the Wailing, which is prohibited Akhrajuh ibn Majah And Shaykh al-Mahm authenticated in the so we take note of that as well. When the sun passes, we don't get to get in the house three days, 40 days, 30 days, yearly, or bi yearly. There's different things we do. It's not allowed. And it's also not the way we leave condolences. That's not how you do aza. If someone passes away, they condolences. You see them, you give their condolences. You can call them, you can, you know, you meet them on your way or the message, wherever they may be. You come across them, you give them their condolences. They don't set up a place in the house for the deceased staff and they make the food. Subhanallah, they have a calamity and they're making food on top of that. What is this? You know, giving the food to the people there, you have the ones who are suffering and they come to them expecting the food. So no, it's far from Islam. Tayyip, this hadith teaches us this element of the affairs of Jahiliyyah. Of course, we covered these things in more detail in the Messiah of Jahiliyyah, but what's the shahid of the hadith? Well, it's the sqa'u bin najum, the prohibition of seeking rain through the stars. So here's the first hadith Shaykh Islam is teaching us of the prohibition of this uh, affair. Next he brings the hadith of Zayb bin Khalid of Juhani radiyallahu ta'ala anhu. The Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, or well, he said that he's afwan, the Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam led us in subah prayer, fajr prayer in Hudaybiyyah after a rainy night. When he completed the prayer, he turned towards the people and said, do you know what your Lord said? They answered Allah and his Messenger know best. Thereupon he said, Allah said, some of my slaves woke up in this morning believing in me and others disbelieving. As, to, as for the one who says, we have been granted rain due to Allah's favor and His mercy, such is a believer in me and this believer in the stars. And whoever says we have been granted rain due to so and so star has disbelieved in me and believed in the stars. Hadith Bukhari Muslim. So this hadith is very clear as well in terms of the prohibition of this action of attributing the rainfall to the stars and not Allah. So Khalid bin Zayd bin Khalid radiyallahu ta'ala said Salla lana Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam bil Hudaybiyya wa salatu subah bil Hudaybiyya The subah prayer al Hudaybiyya ala ithr al-sama kanat min al-layl So it's a rainy night, so rain has already fallen And then after he finished the prayer, he turned to the companions told them Hal tadurun maza qala rabbukum Do you know what your Lord has said? Qalu they say Allah wa Rasul al-Arab Allah the Messenger know best To which then he said sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Allah, he said, أَسْبَحَ مِنْ عِبَادِي مُؤْمِنٌ بِي وَكَافِرٌ Some of my servants woke up with disbelievers in me and others believers. فَأَمَّا مَنْ قَالَ مُطِرْنَا بِفَضْلِ اللَّهِ وَرَحْمَتِهِ فَهُوَ مُؤْمِنٌ بِي كَافِرٌ بِكَوْتَرٌ Whoever says it's been 
who have been rained upon due to Allah's bounty and mercy, then this is a believer in me and this believer in the in the stars. This one disbelieved in me and believed in the kawkab, the star. So here the Shaykh Ibn Uthaymin explaining step by step to start the subah, this is the dawn prayer, and they're praying the Hudaybiyyah. And the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, after that, because the rain has fallen, he addressed them. And the Shaykh says the benefit that you can say Hudaybiyyah with a takhfif or with a shdeed. So Hudaybiyyah or Hudaybiyyah, either way. And it's a place near Mecca. Some parts will fall outside the, the sacred place, the Haram of Mecca. And this is a six year hijrah. We know Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam went to perform the Umrah, and the polytheists and the came prevented them. Tayyib, then the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi told them, Do you know what your Lord said? He's asking a question to stir their attention. Now, of course, they don't know what Allah, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala said. So they said, Allah is listening, you know best. So he's trying to get their attention. This is a way of teaching. And here, he then tells them, now after they say Allah is Messenger, you know best. And this is reality, Allah A'lam, always Allah He knows best. And the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is alive, so at that time they said the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi knows best. And for us now that he died, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we say, Allah A'lam, Allah knows best. And he says here then, in relation to this, that some of my slaves woke up believing in me and others disbelieving. And so how is this? The Shaykh says here, as for the one who says, he has been granted, we have been granted rain to Allah's favor and mercy. This is the one who is expressing with his tongue and his heart this belief that the fault of the favors and other benefits are from Allah. Now, Rahmah is one of Allah's attributes, which with favor and, and provision are bestowed upon the creation. And we know Allah talks about rain with Rahmah. Allah says, Take a look at the signs of the mercy of Allah. Rain is referred to as the mercy of Allah as well. So when we, the rain, he said, whoever said this statement, that the rain came to us from Allah, we can attribute blessings to Allah, fadlihi wa rahmatihi. This is a believer in Allah, this believer in the, in the kawka. But the shahid is the one who says the other one, مُطِرْنَا بِنَوْهِ kada wa kada. We've been rained upon due to the star such and such. This is the issue. And so, yeah, so this one is, uh, is the one that he's paying attention to, Shaykh Islam. Because attribution will fall to the star by way of cause. Because if this was the meaning, then we would have seen the rain of so and so fell upon us. Now, Shaykh breaks it up and he gets into a discussion in relation to what's the problem with saying that statement. Because you can say the statement with a different meaning and you can say with the statement with the wrong meaning. So when you say, with the ba here, this ba, this ba can be interpreted to have different meanings. And we know in the Arabic language there are many types of ba, or the ba has many usages. And we'll just mention some of the examples here so we can get an idea of what the Shaykh is doing here. Shaykh Islam is talking about where the prohibition is and why this statement can be used wrongly, when you, apparently. It's not allowed to attribute it, first of all. But if you use it in a certain way, you can get, a, you can get away with that meaning, but give a different meaning. But it's actually not allowed to do that because it's, it's going to confuse people. So we have ba, in Arabic language there is ba, and whenever you find the letter ba, when it's used as the, as the heart of the particle, it's used often as ba as sababiyya, the ba of causation, so it's called ba as sababiyya, the ba of causation. In this case it's causation. Mutirna, we were rained upon, be we through the cause, by way of this star. That ba in this sentence is sababiyan, gives you sabab, reason. So when you say the statement, that's why it's wrong. But another way of using ba would be for al isti'ana, assistance. So ba al isti'ana. Ba al isti'ana, you might when you find it in the basmala. And also for baraka. When you say Bismillah rahman rahim or Bismillah, what is this ba here? You know, the actually have khilaf, the Mu'tazila come out of here. I expose myself in this chapter. Because they're clever with the Arabic, they try to get around with their beliefs. But Allah Sunnah will say, Bismillah. When you wish to to Salah, Shaykh Islam, what does he tell us? Bismillah. What does Bismillah mean? You're seeking Allah's isti'ana and tabarruk, blessings of Allah to aid you. So, bad isti'ana. 
Well, Mu'tazila, the Atizad, they say, Ba'a Sahaba. It's another one. It's Ba'a companionship only. Why? Ma'ad ma'ala ma'a. So with the name of Allah. What is this? Because they don't believe that this is Aqeed in relation to Isti'ana. In relation to Tabarruq. And so regarding here, Isti'ana is Ibad. So we know what I'm talking about. That's what we say. Bismillah. The Ba'a here, but it's, it's for Isti'ana. It's also for Tabarruq, seeking blessing. Yes, there's also Ba'a of Musahaba, the Ba'a of companionship, by way of Ma'a. So you can use the word with Ma'a. Allah says, Ihbitu. Ihbit bi salam. Descend bi salam. Which means Ma'a salam. With salam, with peace. So, Ba'a has these different meanings. When it comes to Basmala, we said, the Sunnah we say, it means Isti'an and Tabarruq. So next time, sometimes you read this, in the beginning, you don't know what's going on here. When you read more of the books of you say, ah, it's the Mu'tazi, when they interpret it as Musahaba, they're running away from Isti'an and Tabarruq. Something wrong with the Aqeedah. But when you use the word, and also Sabiya we mentioned. So when someone said, it was written to us, be no ikada wa kada, which bad they're referring to? Most likely as Sabiya or Musahaba or Isti'an. No one is going to interpret it, or very few times, Ba is used in Arabic as Dharfiyan. That's the last one, Dharfiyan. Dharfiyan means like the word fee. In. Right, it's a Dharf, you know? So, as a circumstance, or conditional circumstantial statement. So sometimes Ba is used, very few times in the Arabic language, as the, with the meaning of fee. In. So, Salah al Ulam says, Shabbat Imam says, the Hanabi al Sub Ulam says, if you say this statement, Motirna bi no'i kada wa kada, meaning we reign to us in the time period when that star was there, fi, then you can get away with that. It's jazz. But who is going to understand that? So that's what Hadi Adam said. If you're going to try to say something like that, you should say, Motirna fi no'i kada wa kada. Because if someone hears bad, they're thinking, like, are you saying that star came out and that's why it reigned? And so this discussion, obviously, the ulama said, close the door on it. Because Rasul Hassan, did he say you're allowed to say it? He said, This person who said this statement, Kafirun bi. Allah says he disbelieves in me. So obviously had a sunnah we also talk about closing the door to evil. Right? So you don't want to always come around phrase, phrases or terms that have confusing meanings. Why? Because if we don't clarify ourselves, people are gonna be confused what you're talking about. So that's just a side benefit in terms of the word bad and how it's different usage. But the end conclusion is with this statement, usually it's referring to Sanabiyya, the cause, the causation, bad causation. Therefore, we're not supposed to say that when the rain falls. In fact, we're supposed to say, as the Prophet mentioned, that the rain came to us from Allah, His mercy is bounty. Is it clear? So we don't want to entertain that. Shaykh al-Islam then moves to the last part of this chapter, which is dealing with the statement of Allah. The ayat of Allah in Surah Al-Waqi'ah, they came down, ayat 75 to 82. Where Allah says, فَلَا أُقْسِمْ بِمُوَاقِعِ النُّجُومَ So I swear by the setting or the mansions of the stars until the end of the verses. These verses, Ibn Abbas said, some people said that so-and-so star has accomplished such and such. So to this statement, Allah sent down these ayat, showing the stars they don't benefit in any regard. So it's a very big issue here to protect us from those things. Then the Shaykh Muslim, he gets into the tafsir of the ayat, which obviously are outside the chapter, but benefit anyways. Because Kitab al Tawheed al one of the distinguishing signs of his book, he gets into a lot of sciences. As you probably tell already in the sittings, we go from Arabic to Aqidah to Fiqh to language to everywhere. And that's because al Uthaymin was a and Mutafan, one who was specialized in all sciences. And he liked to do this. So he benefits in many places. So he does tafsir here too. And so when you look at this, the chapter really is telling us that the people who said this thing, Allah corrected them. Allah is one sin to them, not the stars. But as a side benefit, we'll read maybe some of the tafsir Sheikh brings. Like in relation to the ayah, Allah says, وَلَا يَمَسُّهُ إِنَّهُ الْقُرْآنُ كَرِيمُ فِي كِتَابٍ مَكْنُونَ لَا يَمَسُّهُ إِنَا الْمُطَهَرُونَ That the Qur'an, really this is the Qur'an that's noble. In the preserved tablet, none touches it except one is pure. So here, Masimi, Shaykh Masimi, Allah is talking about this verse. And this is a side benefit for us. Who are the, who are these people who 
were able to touch the Quran. Sheikh says here, first of all, the meaning of Baydun Maknun, or the word Maknun here, means preserved. Some scholars mention it could be in the Loh al Mahfuz. Others say it means the sheets in the hands of the angels who are scribes. As Nabi Ibn Qayyim he mentions. But nonetheless, none can touch except one is purified. Means, well protected book since it's the closest noun mentioning and it occurs in accusative form. So, she has said we have called attention to, the, to that to refute the view of the one who says that it's something which is not possible. And then he continues discussing in reality that the people who are referred to here as touching it is angels. But some of the ulama, when they talk about this, they say that the verse can also refer to making or having wudu when in uh, having touching the Quran in a state of wudu. For Allah says, لا يمسه, no one touches the Quran with the So some had an derived from that verse, that this is proof that you can only touch the Quran if you have wudu. The Quran says, no one touches the Quran who is purified. But the other group of scholars, they argue, well, no. Mutahharun here means manaika and dahu mahfud. Nothing to do with the mushaf that we have. So when you look at the ayah, you say, well, yeah, you can argue both ways, the side benefit. Is that actually a proof for touching the Quran with wudu or not? Some will use it and some will reply quickly and say, no, look, the, read the ayah carefully, what it's referring to. Nonetheless, the Quran here is described in these terms, and the Shaykh keeps going to giving the tafsir. And the Shaykh will suffice with this much because. The chapter we're trying to prove here is not permissible to ascribe the rainfall to the stars. A side benefit, is it permissible or is it sunnah to say it after it rains? Muturna bifadlillahi wa rahmatihi. Is that a sunnah? If you read Hashim Muslim, yeah. Because it's there, right? And some of you notice that, that dua is there. But some of them don't see that. That's actually a dua you actually say. So some of the people now argue, yes, it's sunnah to do that when it rains, after it rains. Whereas others say no, because we don't know what Sulaiman Sahaba actually read it. Yes, Allah's Messenger said it here, but He didn't say every time it rains, say it. See the difference? He said, whoever did say such statements, I believe that Sulaiman Sahaba actually read it. Whereas others say, no, because we don't know what Sulaiman Sahaba actually read it. Yes, Allah's Messenger said it here, but He didn't say every time it rains, say it. See the difference? He said, whoever did say such statements, I believe that then He is a believer. But He didn't say after every time it rains, say Mutinna and Fadlullah wa Rahmati. So some had read, they argue that it is true. Like Imam Nawawi in his Kitab al Azkar, he mentions it, what to say after it rains. So this is where Hashim Muslim gets it from. Imam Nawawi again, Sharah. Muhazzab, he also says this. Sheikh bin Baz, Rahmanullah, takes his view. It's Sunnah. Then Nasai brings a chapter in Nasa and Shunna uh, Kubra, what you say after it rains. So that's where it comes from, in case you might find it. It's not a Hissan Mu'min, but it's a Hissan Muslim. Why? This is a khilaf. This is the difference you find. Some scholars don't see it to be that. I'll say, yeah, it is, because the Sunnah confirmed that kind of statement. So, side benefit in terms of when it rains. As for when it's actually raining, we know. There's another dua that comes in the Sayyidin. Allahumma Sayyid and Afi'an. Allah make it wholesome and beneficial. This is while it's raining. But in terms of after rains, then some scholars say, yes, you say this. So it's a side benefit. Why is this chapter important? Because some of us may be saying, what's the benefit of this chapter? Well, no, most of us want to attribute the rain to stars. It's not very logical. Is that when we study even science, we need to be careful about how we attribute Allah's blessings. So there's a question they asked Shaykh Salah Fawzan, Hafizullah, that we're in secondary school, in high school students, and the geography material, it ascribes the rain to wind or climate, or to such and such an arena or field. Is this something correct? Now what is it upon the students and to, towards the student in relation to this material? And <coughs> Shaykh said that they should inform the principal, so he may inform the teacher that this Expression and wording is not allowed. Well, the textbook doesn't tell you the rain comes from the rain water cycle and this thingy and that. And he doesn't tell you it comes from Allah. So some people may believe that the rain comes through the water cycle or the rain cycle or whatever it may be. And you forget Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings out the rain. So this is also important in some of the science and things of this nature. While we're learning how things may occur, we don't forget the Musabbat. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I always have to remember that. So for us as students as well in secular studies, we gotta catch ourselves when we're reading and studying things, and Allah is never mentioned. Well, the aqeed always got Allah SWT as well doing this. So it's a side benefit because it has practical implications. And I find that, of course, we all study science or something like this or geography. Well, we probably covered it. Now we see, ah, we have to make sure that we also make sure we always pay attention to giving Allah His haqq and His right. For He is the mudabbir, the khaliq, the razib, 
we shall end with this much on this chapter. For we benefit the point that is permissible to seek rain through the stars or attribute that to the stars. In fact, we should always attribute all blessings to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If anyone has any questions or something that they ask, they'd like to ask, and they can do so. Yes. So, also in reference to um, studying science, um, if, um, so you said that um, taking, falsely taking something as a means for something else is a minor shirk. So, if I, um, as a scientist, um, make a false hypothesis that something causes something else, uh, for example, I don't know, some vegetable causes some kind of illness, but it turns out that that was false. So, um, is that also a minor shirk? This is obviously in relation to research and study. So this is a dhan, this is an opinion you held. And of course, we know even in medicine, the medical community, there are opinions about different things. This food my heart, this yeah. may not, this exercise is good for your back, this isn't. There's so much opinions. Yeah. So if you have an opinion, and you go to confirm it, to prove it, that actually has an actual effect, then this is different. There's someone who actually firmly believes something which has no causation. Has a cause, it's not allowed. Because it's a means to major shit. So tomorrow, first you may have the opinion, and then tomorrow you believe it's actually a cause, and you actually believe it actually does something. Right, so it leads you there. So obviously in science, when you research, you start with that box, it's you prove it, and it's really rejected. Yeah. And that's how we learn from true tajruba. We said before, um, one way to learn the means is through experimentation and reality of things. So for example, somebody may say, I don't know if this, this particular type of food has any effects to your digestive system, so okay, let's eat it. You eat it, okay, you find out, maybe it does. So you learn through experience, and then when you learn, you can actually confirm the cause. This is actually a cause of stomach illness if we eat this kind of fruit, because we tried it and it got us sick. That's how you learn. Otherwise, we would never know any experimentation of anything, like we don't know what's good or bad. So it's nothing wrong to believe something or to have the idea of it, but then to double check. What we're not allowed to do is believe something firmly as a cause with no proof. Al-Kitab, al And we see people today won't do that, are superstitious or they're falling in ignorance. You mentioned an example like you believe certain uh, bracelets, uh, pure rheumatism, or this uh, other stuff that people have in their head. It's all placebo effects, they have no effect, right? But just imagine it. Right? So, this is different than science where you're studying to learn. Right? And of course, that's why we say science is study of science. Right? To learn things that Allah SWT has given us is not the haram of that. Uh, is it when it rains, is there a good time to make blood during rain? The scholars differ on terms of authenticity of the hadith or rainfall is a time for dua. Sheikh al authenticates the hadith, and some say it's a mursal, and it has other roots, but they're not sahih. So some say yes it is, and the Rasulullah said, was as hard to say, to search for the istijaba, the acceptance of dua, and the salah, and he mentioned one of them, and the nuzul al ghayf or in the nuzul al but some scholars look at the hadith and say, no, what you should just do is ask them to make a wholesome rain, and that's it. So there's a khilaf on it. Those who authenticate the hadith say it's something recommended, and those who can say, no, there is nothing like that. So obviously it depends on what person falls in the research. The hadith can be obviously established to different routes, but many scholars, they, when they discuss it, they do point out there is weakness. In regards to the uh, topic of uh, having the uh, I think we might have translated something on this before. It's a khilaf, a big one. All right. So the ulama they split on this. Salaf al khalafa From the salaf and afterwards, so you need to have wudu touch mushaf. And you probably read before different views. One argument they use that the ulama who said you have to are like the four imams. All right. So the four the imma, Shaykh Islam and Taymiyyah, Ibn Abbas and his student. Even you know, the students, you know, they hold the view you have to. Saman al Faris and Saman al Qas, they're all inside, you have to. And they bring proofs to show that you have to. One of them is the hadith. And we found the Malta Malik and Nasai, and the Sulu said, La yamassu al Mushaf illa tahir. This is the clearest of proofs to use. They strengthen the hadith. No one touches the Mushaf if someone is pure. The Allah who said not to, from the Salaf, many of them. Of today's time, some of the big scholars, be Shaykh al for example, Rahimullah, even Hazim before him, others, they say no. I said, Ulama al Yemen, they say no, there's, that's not proof enough. The Hayyid has weakness, they say, it's Abdul Hayyid Amr, be Hazim. And secondly, they say, if you authenticate the word Tahir, means Mu'min. Because SubhanAllah, 
al mu'min la yinjus. They mean the hadith of Huraira and Bukhari Muslim believe in everything that's just. So Tahir means a believer. So of course, every believer that's Muslim. Second proof, they might use also that besides the weakness of the hadith, they say the ayah in Surah Waqi'ah that the Allah calls you, say that's, that's talking about Malaika, that's not talking about the Muslim. Then they say more than that, Rasul Sassim used to write letters to the different kings, and he had the ayat in the Quran, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, ayat, these are kufar, and just, how come they're holding it and you can't hold it? So I have a lot of arguments, they bring it, you also say, yeah, they have a good point, they say mustahab them. But obviously if you say for you, for some Sahaba, and some argue that this is the opinion well known to those. So Shaykh Islam mentioned the opinion of Sa'ad al Waqas, authentic, Samana Farisi, and others, and no one of the Sahaba who know different with them, it's talking about Abbas and his students. So some say, therefore, it's a stronger view, safer, and seems to be almost like a well-known view that no one disagree, disagree with that. But of course, the Khilaf, I mean, it's so big that the Kitab Musahib, Ibn Abi Dunya, Ibn Abi Dawood, it brings one page, Sahaba will say yes, the other page, the other say no. So it's not like some people for the day and night fight, no, you can't, you can't, nothing. This is bigger than us, big events are on this side. This is your side, they want you believe it, because Khilaf is the of hand. And of course, you may argue which is stronger, but in the beginning, they feel like, you are fighting over something which is not supposed to find you. You see, actually see it's more complicated than it is. Right? So those are how they are. Of course, you know, other scholars, they're waiting on to you know, you know, the Bar of Shokan and the others. And we've tried this some before, you can read it. But you may say, well, Allah A'lam, the majority, Allah A'lam, the majority of the ulama tend to be on the side that it's not allowed. It seems to be. From what I read in research, well, this is, seems to be something that can be said. The majority is on that side. But that doesn't mean it's haq only, right? And we know that. Allah A'lam. Other questions or points? Uh, uh, what, is it, what is necessary for a Muslim uh, in order to uh, pretty much trim his body hair? Like, is there uh, a specific amount of things that have to go by? So these, this issue of trimming the body hair and the things of this is from the, the aspects of the, of the fitrah. So we know the Hayat Abu Huraira and Aisha Rasulullah told us that khams are five things in the fitrah of Ruwai Ashur in the fitrah, ten things. And then Rasulullah mentioned these, and from things he mentioned, not for ibit, plucking the underarm hair, or haluk al-ana, trimming or shaving uh, the pubic hair. And he mentioned also from those things is the qasr al-sharib, trimming the mustache. Leaving the beard alone uh, to grow, and so and then uh, taqlim al far the nails. So the major ones people when they talk about this is the trimming of the nails, the shaving the pubic hair, plucking of the underarm hair, trimming the mustache. And with this khilaf, what does that mean? But with the correct view is that it means that it doesn't extend below the lip, and the mustache doesn't come fall into your mouth. And the last is that uh, also do your underarm hair. Um, so a person, Hayd Anas, he gives us, Hayd Muslim, have 40 days maximum where someone can leave these hairs and these things left alone. And that doesn't mean that you wait till 40. Some people say, I'll have 40 days. And then by then the mustache is down there. It's not the way. Once it reach there, you cut it. This is from the khair, right? But at least we have until then. And this shows you again, these affairs also show the Islam comes with this. Also from those things are the khitan, the circumcision. Very emphasized, especially for the men, the young especially. And other things like this, like using the miswak and so on. The Muslim, these ones with their body hair, you should be careful not to let them slide. Shaykh Ibn Rahim said, even you can use a, 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 a schedule to help you remember what time you kind of last and what time you have to kind of next. So you have calendars, I'm going to use it. Because you don't want to fall in the disobedience of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam but also to be in a form that is not pleasing. So the pubic hair, the underarm hair, the mustache, and then the nails. As for the pubic hair, it can, it can be, it should be shaved. This is a sunnah. But some of these other methods, right, to move it, then he removes it. Now the thing about it also is that it's from the benefits and the cleanliness of Islam. But we know in Islam, it comes for cleanliness, it's part of it. Now today we know that I'm Muslim are just learning <coughs> some aspects of some of these things that Islam has already come with. In the past, they didn't have this concept. Even under our hair, when I was in today's waqt, people are bringing it back for some reason. Some people, I don't know why. Some people are celebrating this. And this applies for both women and men, they have to. So it should be shaved. And I must use the Musa, right? The actual shave, like razor. But if you use other means, it's fine. As for the underarm hair, 
Parking leads were mentioned. If you're tough enough to do it, yeah. otherwise, then you just, you shave. It's like that. Even Shafi on the himself said one narration that we quote, Shafi himself is not, I can't withstand the pain. All right? So this is the difficulty. You can literally pluck it. That's the way that the Sahaba would do it. Yeah, but then shave it, move it. And obviously, we know the side benefit is to produce the cleanliness of the body and sense as well. For those kind of areas, we know sweat accumulates. And also bad smell comes. We know as Muslim, we shouldn't be in that state. So 40 days what you have, and someone should be careful on that. Now some people see they don't know this though, they've forgotten them. And if someone is married, haqqa min dhalik, he has more right to that. Because we know for the husband and wife, both have to be fine himself. So it's very important, sometimes you forget these things. Ibn Abbas, what he used to say, I verily adore myself for my wife, the same way she adores herself for me. I mean, see, I expect her to do that. So obviously it's not allowed for a man to forget those things. So from Islam, it's very important, it's something of the fitrah. And the ulama, of course, if you research more, you find more about the different things, like, like different ways of going about it, what is considered yes or no, or what difference have come. But for the nails as well, you have the month, but some of will do weekly, as you mentioned, even Umar used to do that, or four weeks before, nightly, four, uh, two weeks. But you have it to four days, and we know also, that growing the nail underneath there comes dirt and dust, and making tahara, it's not good. You underneath your nails with dirty and some things like this. And this applies to women as well. It's not allowed for them to grow their nails more than four days. They have to cut it. It's not for beautification. It's not, they have to. It's from the fitrah. And this all goes back further to the Prophet ﷺ. So as I mentioned, Allah even ordered Ibrahim to do that. We never tell Ibrahim. We, we trial Ibrahim. Ibn Abbas said that's the, the issues of fitrah. Like even cutting, parting the hair for those who have long hair. All the issues of those fitra, some mentioned the ayah. Ibn Abbas, that's what got. even Ibrahim was tested with these. I mean, this one of the long standing things. And we also we benefit from this that Islam calls to cleanliness. So, just something important, and this is what we mentioned. Of course, there's more, but hold on, if you like, we got it. Inshallah, we'll do that. Yes. Just one of the four affairs which we mentioned, the Fakhrul Ihsad, will Istisqab in Najum. And then Niyah, what was the fourth one? Yeah. And Niyah is the fourth one. So we said, Al Fakhr bil Ahsab, so being proud about your descent. And then Ta'an fil Ansab, disparaging somebody else's. And it's this Ta'a bin Nujum, then trying to seek rain through the stars. And the last one is in Niyah. Who is it? In a couple of classes where we were speaking about um, uh, about creation. Using the word creation in uh, reference to the lost creation and, and, and human beings. Um, I, don't know, I wasn't sure if you mentioned that there was like two, um, like two ways or two forms of creation, how Allah creates from, from nothing and uh, human being uh, using the word creation. Just when it comes to the word creation, we said the word creation obviously. In terms of it, it means to create something without a mitan sabbath, without having a prior example. That's what creation is. But the word like to invent, like al bariya, is different than the creation of sala'a to manufacture, produce. So for mankind and the creation, you cannot use the word creation. It's only for Allah. Allah Allahu al wal amr. To Him belong exclusively khalq creation and amr, commandment, revelation. But for human beings, we can do some manufacturing. We can take Allah's creation, we can put it together and make a phone or a computer. Or, and in terms of other words, originating, these are again exclusive to Allah. So there is something different between the word bari versus the word khaliq. Like the bari is usually used for the hayawanat and the human beings, some say, like I mentioned. Whereas khaliq is more, it's even the inanimate. Whereas for human beings, we don't have that word to use. We say creation. So there's a hadith, sahih, Allah khaliq kulli sani'in. Allah creates all the creation, means all manufacturers and producers, and whatever they produce. So you can see someone's a son, yeah, someone's a manufacturer, producer, uh, you know, but you can't see someone's a khala. So if I were to say, like, I made this product, it's fine, you made this means I produced this, you know, but not like, you know, you didn't create it. Because creation from without me, Tala Sabbath. Of course, everything we have, we see Allah's creation, we just imitate. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates from nothing, that's creation. That's what we become, we just piece together some stuff and make a building, that's not creation, that's manufacturing. 
So it's very important. Of course, we use the language as well. We know what we, we intend as well when we say this type of stuff. Like, you know, somebody created something, we know he means made something. Right? But if you're not, obviously, can you can always clarify your words so, so people don't think. Yeah, and of course, uh, most people don't hold that belief when you hear you say I create something. You don't, they know you don't mean you actually created it. Okay, inshallah, we'll win with this much. Subhanakallah, bihamdika, shadwan la ilan, to suffer to relate.